the starting point of, of my today's lecture consists of two quotations. The first one is from the Sir's last book, Making the Social World. Sorry, I took the wrong paper. And uh, in, it is the beginning of the chapter, uh, of the second chapter, where uh, Sir claims that uh, human social ontology is uh, created by human mind. So in order to understand human social ontology, we have to begin with that property of the mind that creates the reality we're trying to analyze. And then he claims that we have to begin with intentionality. I will argue that we have to begin with another property of the mind, or in general of the human organism, which is our cognitive architecture. Not only intentionality, but the cognitive architecture uh, in general, because I want to stress the interaction between uh, human organism and mind, body, uh, physical and social environment. And that is why I have chosen cognitive architecture, because uh, it means that we are talking about this interaction in terms of structure that generates and controls this, this interaction. And then there is another quotation from Mauritius' book, Where Are You? The Ontology of Mobile Phone. Here, there are two things that I want to stress. The first one is that uh, when uh, Mauricio speaks about uh, social objects, he claims that it takes a certain uh, intellectual audacity to uh, consider entities like military ranks, municipality of Pisa, and so on, as objects. So I will try to answer the question where this audacity comes from. And then there is another uh, passage, which is very interesting, and uh, where Maurizio claims that without traces there are no minds, which is theory of tabula, and that only for minds there are traces. So you have a certain uh, interesting dynamics between mind and, and world in general. So I will try to uh, stress this point too. Uh, of course, I have to uh, tell you which authors I was inspired by. And uh, uh, since my um, MA was about uh, embodiment, which is one of the most recent approaches in cognitive sciences, uh, this is why I use a lot uh, this tradition, which means Varela, Thompson, uh, Lakoff and Johnson and some Italian authors also like Maurizio Tirassa who works at the Cognitive uh, Center in, in Turing and of course Gerald Edelman whose approach is completely different because he uh, approaches these problems from the biological point of view while for example even Thompson speaks a lot about phenomenology and this uh, temptation to uh, attempt to uh, conceal the, the phenomenology with the, with the biology. So, uh, the first claim about mind-body and uh, world uh, interaction is that human mind has evolved within the world in order to follow its changes. I think that this claim is the basic one because there is a lot of theories that uh, don't take into consideration this fact. that the world was here before our minds, and that our minds are really made for uh, and evolved to, to uh, follow the changes of the world. Uh, on one side. On the other side, our mind co-evolved with the, our body, and it's unbelievable, really, uh, capacity of uh, object manipulation. And there is another thing which is, of course, peculiar for human uh, for humans not only for humans but uh, when we speak about our cognitive architecture it is very important uh, which is the, cap uh, the capacity of movement so there is the dynamics of the world but there is also the fact that we can move through through space uh, then there is another uh, aspect which I called socialness of our mind because uh, our mind is 
social in, in two senses. The first one is a uh, phylogenetic one because it evolved and uh, it is like it, it pecu peculiar characteristics and aspects uh, are the result of very complex interaction within the community, so within the uh, with the members of the of the same species, and also on the individual level, uh, baby has to grow up within the community to develop certain uh, capacities. Uh, so we can really claim that we are embedded in the very strong social context even before we are born. That's why I have chosen this, this image. And when I argue that we need more uh, dynamic picture, that means that and when we speak about human mind, there is a very, co very complex intervening between cognition and action, and of course, close interaction with the physical and social world. Uh, just a few remarks about brain, because <laughs> it's a huge topic. And uh, I just want to show you how complex it is, and uh, one very important aspect of human brain. Look at those numbers. This is just the cortex. And uh, uh, we have 10 billion neurons just in cortex and 1 million billion connections just in cortical sheet. And what is very, very interesting is that uh, the major portion of brain issues receive input only from other parts of the brain. So this is a kind of clear indication that the matter of mind, this is Gerald's, uh, Gerald Edelman's thesis, uh, interacts with itself a lot. And I will argue that that property of human mind which we have to examine uh, mostly is metacognition, or so-called higher order consciousness. Uh, of course, when we sp speak about human brain, it would be a mistake to uh, ignore the rest of the body because there is an intimate relation between uh, uh, our functions, especially movement and the uh, development of the brain. And this uh, dependence, this means that body form has a very strong influence on the structure of the brain and, and uh, uh, vice versa. Uh, it is probably the most complicated object in the universe as we know because it's unbelievably complex and I will just give two uh, reasons why computer model is completely wrong for uh, our mind and our brain. The first one is because computer has no evolutionary morphology and the second and the second one is uh, a structural argument because there is no convincing evidence uh, that the codes that we use, for example, in telegraphy or in computing is the same one that uh, has been found in, uh, in the human nervous system. Uh, this is about the question that I made before to, to Elena. Uh, since the main topic of my research is the role of memory in the construction of social reality. I just want to stress one very interesting thing. The first one is that adaptivity, as I said before, is circular. So there is interaction between organism and the world. And humans can really change the environment. But of course, environment has a strong influence on, on, on our organisms. And that natural selection acts on individuals. So which means that if something changes during the, the, the evolution, the, it first appears in, in the individuals. And uh, if you analyze different forms of uh, memory, the first one probably is the immune defense system, because there is a selection also within the organisms, and one of those systems is immune defense systems. With this system, which is capable of making difference between self and non-self. This is very interesting. And this is a, a, a tricky question because probably this is one of the interpretations. But if you have some kind of invader in your organism, antibodies will 
be created and will attack the invader. So, which means that your organism is capable of making difference between self and no self. And that means that that system has memory. Uh, I have chosen three pictures. The first one is DNA chain, which is another form of memory. And there is another, I'm, actually I'm, I'm, I'm writing a paper about uh, the famous biblical episode of uh, Ark uh, of Noah and, uh, and the construction of the Ark, because as you know, in that episode, God uh, orders Noah to uh, construct the Ark as a kind of bank of biodiversity, where there are all animals, all living creatures that have to be saved, and this kind of uh, request of saving memory of the world. And of course, at that time, Noah is not, he doesn't know that they have genetic codes that are uh, transmitting information, but the, the idea is, is, is that one. And that's why the arc as a, as a structure is the model or the image of memory which is used very uh, often in the medieval tradition. The other one is the second uh, image, which is a pigeon house. It's another image which is used a lot in the first time, probably in Plato, and then in uh, Saint, um, Thomas Aquinas uses this picture also, Hugh and Victor, and so and so on and so forth. But it's a picture uh, which we are using for uh, trained memory because the idea is that you have certain information positioned in, the, in the different uh, places in your mind. So topos is very important for this image of memory. And the third one is the very um, modern form of memory, which is the SIM card that you all have in your cellular phones. But what I want to say, what I want to stress here is, not, is that this model of memory, uh, which is a kind of archive or storehouse, is not appropriate if we speak about human memory, because human memory is much more dynamic. It's in service of, of action. So it allows us to use the past experience in a very situated way. And that's why it's not a simple reproduction, but it's continuous recategorization. And it allows us to read the present in a historical and dynamic way. So from this point of view, to remember is always to, to act. And here, I just want to raise a problem, because this regards Maurizio's theory. Uh, when Maurizio uh, uh, is criticized uh, Searle's theory, uh, one of the problems in Searle's theory is the passage from social to, to physical. So there are certain social objects that don't have a uh, physical counterpart. And for example, there is a, I can make a promise to Maurizio that I will give him back the book on, on Thursday, but with no written note. And the idea of Maurizio in, in, in his work is that there is a, some kind of inscription in my mind, so I can remember that I have to give him back the book. And uh, he also probably can remember that I have to give him back the book. But the, the, the question is, uh, if you want to reduce the, the, the question on, uh, on uh, biochemical level, on physiological level, what we know from neurology is that memory is a variation of synaptical force of the global map, and that since contexts are changing, neurons which were involved in the original categorization, they change all the time. So the question is, is it possible? I don't have the answer in this moment, and this uh, the, the one of the, the aims, let's say, the scopes of, of my research. Can we say really that there is some kind of trace or inscription in our mind which can uh, really be
the, 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 the physical counterpart of the, of the promise as a social object in this, in this case. Uh, I will finish with uh, metacognition as, uh, as a property of, of my, our mind, which is, in my opinion, the most, the most important one. Uh, I have chosen this picture because I think that uh, stock exchange markets are real knots of, of social life and uh, they are, uh, this is the best image to explain how uh, complicated and uh, complex uh, our, our social uh, life became with the, with the technology that we have. And this is one of the, the themes that uh, Maurizio uh, is dealing with very often, like you know, more mobile phone, phones, internet, and things like that. And I just want to stress that if we speak in terms of primary consciousness, which you have in, in some animals, and which is a state of being just mentally aware of things in the world, and if you speak about higher order consciousness, which presumes identity model, then model where we can conceive past, present, and future, and the most important thing is the fact that we are conscious of being conscious, then there is a very interesting parallelism between higher order consciousness and higher order objects, which are social objects. Uh, what is important to say about primary consciousness is that uh, it is not accompanied by any sense of a person with the past and future while higher order consciousness involves the recognition by a thinking subject of its own acts and, and the factions. And uh, this is Edelman's idea, uh, since in order to acquire this capacity, which is higher order consciousness, systems of memory must be related to a conceptual representation of a true self, of social self, acting in an environment and, and vice versa. So there is a circularity between uh, organism and the environment and of course a new capacity which is conceptual representation. Uh, then there is another very important thing which is a long-term storage of symbolic relations which is acquired through interactions with the individuals of the same species. So it is very important the social context for development for the development of these of these capacities. Uh, emergence of this ability, so the ability to distinguish uh, these conceptual symbolic models from what we perceive in our experience, so perceptual experience. Uh, this is how a concept of the past can be can be. Uh, developed and this fact, this, this uh, model frees the individual from the very strong bondage to an immediate time frame of, of ongoing events occurring in, in real time. And that is what uh, Edelman calls that uh, remember present is then placed within a framework of past and future. Because you have certain species which are really uh, slaves of remember present. They can only, uh, they have only uh, the uh, perception of, of the ongoing uh, uh, experience. Uh, on the other side, the embodiment of, of meaning and reference can be related to real objects and events by the re-entrant connections between what I just already, what I just said, uh, this value category memory and perception, which is similar to primary consciousness. And there are also simultaneous interactions that can occur between some symbolic memory and the same conceptual centers. And this is how our inner life uh, developed uh, and it's of course based on language in a speech community and this is where 
I completely agree with John Searle that language is very, very important in, uh, in social reality, in the construction of social reality. Just a few remarks uh, on higher order consciousness, which is, as you, um, as I just said, uh, based on new type of, of memory, that's symbolic memory, then, of course, on the concept of self, and on new systems of transmission and social communication, which is language. And this frees us from, as Edelman said, the tyranny of uh, remembered, the tyranny of rem uh, remembered present. On the other side, the interaction between language and conceptual centers allow, allows really uh, a kind of explosion of concepts. Uh, Mauritius Mauricio spoke about the explosion of writing in his books, but uh, if we uh, analyze this situation from the evolutionary point, point of view, this was the moment when uh, really a real ontological revolution happened. And uh, now, if we speak about our mind, we have really a kind of mental space in which we move as a in the physical space, because our mind is in continual interaction with physical and uh, world and with itself. So we have, on one side we have mental affordances, and on the other side we have ecological affordances. And this is how, uh, this is very nice to stress that only humans can conceive the possibility to, to die for something like an idea borderline or a, or a sense or a sense of duty. Uh, I won't go in detail about different uh, cognitive architectures. I will just say that uh, <coughs> our cognitive architecture is the representational one and it's decoupled which means that its uh, internal dyna dynamics uh, can be independent of the external one and that we have the cap capability of conceptualizing the world in an abstract way, which is also very important for, for uh, construction of social uh, reality, that we can use symbols both as landmarks for some kind of affordance and for affordance that we find in, uh, in, uh, in, in the world of mind. And uh, another aspect which was also stressed by uh, Maurizio is that the, thing, the, the fact that we can externalize and fix certain entities of the world as action, word or rule as endowed with public meaning means that we can share knowledge and visions of the world and that is what makes social reality. I will end my presentation with a very nice uh, example that I found in um, it's a book by written by a group of authors, but there is a paper of uh, Maurizio Tirassa and uh, another author is Carassa. They are both from uh, cognitive center in, in Turin. And there is a very nice proof that our mind is world dependent and it's a dream. Because while we are dreaming, there is no, uh, pr the external world is not present as a, as, a, as a promemoria or as a support for our memory. So we must lean only on uh, uh, resources of our mind. And what our mind is, is creating during uh, the in, in dreams is just what we need for a certain kind of action. So if you analyze the scenes in, in dreams, they are very poor. You, have, you don't have a lot of details like you have in a, in a real scene, which you can perceive even now. If you, can, if you dream the same uh, scene as this one, you, you wouldn't have all these, all these details. And this is I think the, the very interesting aspect that we have to stress when we speak about things like how 
we can create a social ontology, which is not something subjective. I think that the right uh, emphasis must be put on this very complex interaction between mind and the world. And this will be probably my next step, but only in, in, in terms of, of memory. Thank you.